So hi everybody, thanks for joining us and welcome to the first opening session of the EASA Safety Week 2023. Uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm John Franklin and I'm head of the safety promotion team here at EASA and I'm going to be walking you through as head of our first cross domain session. We've got uh, some great panellists uh, to introduce you to shortly uh, and hopefully a really interesting an engaging week of discussions and, and all sorts of other things to uh, to come over the coming four days. So just to, to really get things started, um, I'm going to give you a few kind of introductory house rules and, and things about how this is going to work. So for people who are connected on the WebEx, so we simultaneously uh, on WebEx and on the YouTube live stream on the uh, the Asset Together for Safety uh, YouTube. So if you're in the WebEx, you can ask us questions and we'll be doing polls and other things. If you go to the bottom right hand corner of the screen, uh, you should see apps and then Slido. And if you open the Slido, you should be able to see then uh, the ability to ask questions and we'd love you to engage with us. Uh, and ask questions of our panelists throughout and I'll be starting a poll very, very shortly. So we'll do all of that. Um, if you're in the YouTube, again, feel free to use the YouTube chat uh, and, and ask questions that way. Otherwise, uh, another option is you could go to the uh, Slido to sli.do uh, hashtag EASA summer 2023 uh, and you do it that way. Probably the easiest thing if you're in YouTube is to use the chat. So, that's kind of the basics. If you're having any technical problems, we have a test stream running and everything seems to be running OK. Uh, but if you have a problem, feel free to use the chat to talk to me and, and to the team here to tell us if there's any problems going on and all of that kind of stuff. So that's all of the main bits. We're going to start now uh, with a quick introduction from EASA's Flight Standards Director, Jesper Rasmussen. So I'm going to hand over to Jesper, who will give his video. The summer is approaching. Flight bookings are up and we are all ramping up to pre-COVID levels of business. This is in many ways good news, but it comes with a challenge. Whatever role you play in your industry, we need to move together as organizations and as individuals. Whether we like it or not, we make up the aviation system and aviation safety together. Over the past months, EASA has been working with our stakeholders to update the list of safety risks that we can expect to see this summer. Let me just mention a few. First, shortage of competent and trained staff. Second, unrealistic resource planning and ability to cope with major disruptions. Third, availability of spare parts. Fourth, route congestion, and there are more. As a foundation, we must rely on the rules that govern our safety system. Despite whatever challenges we face, we should make no comp compromises on safety. If you are in a management position, I would urge you to remember that you set the tone for the culture and mindset of your organization also during the coming easy period. It is not possible to push the people, the equipment and the entire system to its limits for the whole summer. We have, so to speak, a marathon to run between now and October. We cannot sprint for that long. To capture our safety activities this summer, we say three things. Be ready, be resilient and be responsive. But what does that really mean? Being ready means having enough competent people and all the resources to manage risk effectively so you can ensure safe and effective operations. 
plan ahead and be realistic in your scheduling. Being resilient, that means that your organization will probably need to have some redundancy built into your processes and activities. Are you prepared for any operational challenges and external threats you might face? Do not push the boundaries of the rules. Be always on guard for risk transfer. And mitigation in one place may create a new risk somewhere else in your organization. Being responsive, that means that you're prepared to changing conditions. Things will change over the summer. There will be differences between what you have planned and the operational reality. Keep the culture that encourages your colleagues to report occurrences so you can learn and, and adjust immediately. Listen to your staff and colleagues so they trust you to tell also the bad news. React positively and quickly. Take clear actions and communicate clearly to everybody involved. This ERs a safety week consists of seven sessions covering the key operational domains, in addition to the cross-domain discussions taking place in this opening session this morning. During the week, strategic leaders and operational experts will share their thoughts on the summer challenges with insight on how the main safety issues uh, are handled and how also come with practical advice on how to manage things during busy times. Our safety week is a part of the ASA's bigger summer safety campaign. The agency will shortly publish a safety information bulletin with actions for industry to manage the top safety issues we have identified. I'm sure that you have already done a lot of preparation for summer. In fact, we should be in a far better situation than last year, where many were caught completely by surprise. I hope you can use what you learned from the safety week. When the safety week is over and you get back to your busy work, I hope our headlines can help you to remember the main points. Be ready, be resilient and be responsive. I hope that the Safety Week adds value to your work. Welcome and thank you. And that's really what this week's all about. It's about us, uh, both the ASA and all of the different collaborative partners that we have across the industry and, and uh, all coming together uh, to try and collaborate and discuss the challenges that we have and, and, and hopefully provide lots of practical solutions in, uh, as part of the discussion. Just to give you a really quick idea about what the time scale for the different things you'll see looks like. You know, this week we've got the safety week, so we've got seven different webinars over the course of the next four days and I'll show you what the agenda looks like in case you want to register for any other sessions and haven't already. Then next week we're preparing at the moment, um, finalising uh, with the other advisory bodies uh, an SIB that should be published hopefully next week, possibly the week after. Um, and to go with that will be a whole pile of campaign promotional material, uh, posters, um, things that you can use in your organization. They'll be white branded. So if you just want to add your logo to the presentation and use it in your own discussions in your organizations, all of those kinds of things will be available in the, in the next week or so. We'll be doing lots of things on LinkedIn. Particularly, we have uh, a conversation aviation uh, LinkedIn group where we encourage you to share challenges and, you know, again, uh, have discussions and all of those kinds of things. We've got different podcast interviews coming up as well, and then lots of follow-up activities. So the week of the 19th of June, we have uh, then an unruly passengers week, particularly focusing on that challenge and, and safety in the cabin. Um, then throughout July and August, we've got lots of further promotion, particularly around occurrence reporting. And then the week of the 7th of August, we're going to have a winter readiness week uh, with uh, various people, uh, EasyJet, hopefully, uh, and other organizations uh, organizing uh, a week of events just to help people be ready for the winter. Hopefully, that won't come on the hottest day of the year, but who knows? That's the way sometimes these things work out. In terms of safety week itself, 
Um, here are the different sessions. So we've got the cross domain discussion this morning. Um, we're talking about air ops this afternoon, aerodromes and ground handling tomorrow morning, uh, maintenance and continue airworthiness tomorrow afternoon, uh, flight training ATO on Thursday morning, ATM ANS Thursday afternoon, and then cyber and security uh, on Friday morning. So that's the week of sessions. And this is really what the theme of, of no compromise on safety is all about. It's asking, are you ready, resilient, and responsive enough for the weeks ahead? Uh, you know, rules provide the baseline. How do we identify and manage our risk, uh, understand the uncertainties, whilst also looking after our people? As, as the Jesper said in that introduction there, you know, we've, we've kind of got a marathon to run between now and September. And if we try and set off at a sprint, and particularly in terms of uh, our workforce, kind of you know, work at full speed, you know, we're all going to be collapsed by July. So it, it's how do we support that and how do we manage that? And that's really what we're going to focus on uh, the discussions now. So I'm going to start by asking our panelists to introduce themselves. So uh, first, Libor, hopefully. Uh, Sam works all right. I, we were off the screen for a second, but all gone. Um, can you introduce yourself first, then, Libor, please? Thank you, John, and I wish all of you a very good morning from the Czech Republic. My name is Libor Kurzweil. I am Director of Safety of Prague Airport and also a Chair of the Technical Operations and Safety Committee of the ACI Europe. Great, thanks, and great that you could join us. Mark, maybe can you introduce yourself next? Yeah, thanks very much, John. Good morning, everybody. Mark Searle, Global Director of Safety for IATA, based in Geneva. Thanks, great. You could join us as well. And Osman, next. Uh, thank you, John. My name is Osman Safran. I'm um, at DFS, the John Navigation Service Provider, the Director for Corporate Safety and Security Management, which includes cyber, which I was already uh, touched on. I'm uh, as well Director of Corporate Civil and Military Affairs. Um, really well Russian and uh, playing a very interesting uh, task I do have and I'm allowed to uh, serve as the chair of um, the Council Global Safety Standing Committee and co-chair of the Control Safety Team. Um, John, uh, just, just briefly, I do very much welcome this initiative uh, and we've just had said and we're working on this bullet. Um, uh, we, we command, um, perhaps it will become Thank you very much. Ah, excellent. Good to see that it's already started the uh, consultation. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, and good you could join us. And finally, Pascal. Yeah, good morning. My name is Pascal Kramer. I'm the safety manager for LUXA in Luxembourg, and I also represent the uh, European Regions Airlines Association in this meeting. Great, and thanks uh, for joining us as well, Pascal. So as you see, we've got a, a diverse panel here covering different uh, aspects of, uh, you know, from airlines, uh, ANSPs, from uh, uh, from the airport community. Um, so we're going to start by looking at what are the challenges that we face collectively, particularly at a, from a cross-domain perspective. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to launch the poll first in Slido so that while our, our different panelists are giving their view on the challenges they see this summer, you, know, you can start adding uh, in, we can create, create a word cloud of what we think are the challenges of, of the summer. So uh, if, if I come first to, to you, Pascal, uh, what do you see from, a, uh, from an airline perspective as the challenges that you're facing and particularly where the interfaces are and all of those kinds of things? Yeah, well, um, summer's just around the corner, as we heard, and um, there are quite a few challenges coming up. Um, rapid restart after COVID and increased demands are certainly putting some strain on the system. Um, during the crisis, many of the companies have lost employees, either during um, due to early retirements, layoffs, or because the staff members, and we have faced that quite a lot, have decided to simply uh, change to another industry. Um, repercussions of this are, of course, multiple. Uh, at a systemic level, uh, I would say a loss of corporate knowledge is, is one of the big uh, subjects that we have, loss of competence, we have heard that already. But we have a lot of strain on the selection system. Uh, we have to replace those people that are not in the company anymore. So we have many selections going on, instructors and CRM staff facing a um, um, lot of workload. They are involved in selections and not available for other tasks. Same in the training departments, by the way. Um, not to speak about having enough spare staff or members to cover unforeseen events. 
especially in the context of an increase of sickness reports uh, by staff. And uh, where are these coming from? Well, at a personal level, um, we're looking at uh, fatigue issues amongst the crew uh, because they are uh, having a high workload, uh, increased stress levels, um, which have an impact on staff well-being and motivation, of course. Um, felt or even actual pressures, um, depending in the, on the context, of course, which may lead to mistakes or errors, um, to cutting corners or even worse, to uh, deviance from uh, standard operating procedures or even normalization of deviance. Um, and of course, all of this has an impact on your safety culture and ultimately on the safety of your operations. And if you add to this a potential loss of focus on safety and concentrating too much on operations, well, then you have a pretty bad cocktail in your hands. Um, and then last but not least, I think operationally, we will see events linked to the problems I've just stated. Uh, main areas of concerns for us uh, during operations, ground safety, runway safety and weather, and uh, issues related to the problems I have just stated. And I, I, I hand over to my colleagues now. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Pat Gallen. Maybe, Mark, if I come to you from your side, you know, in terms of IRT, a huge global organisation, you know, I'm sure you, you see lots of different things talking to your members. Yeah, thanks, John. And um, I, I guess I'm going to sort of start with, uh, we talk about um, approaching the summer season. I think uh, what's really clear is that, um, you know, a lot of airlines are already in their summer schedules. So actually the preparation for that starts in sort of March, March time to ensure that actually, you know, when those summer schedules come out, they've got the right number of crew, the right number of aircraft in the right positions with the right schedules to have a smooth operation to ensure that the customer experience as a whole is, um, is something that uh, looks as best as possible as seamless. I think, um, you know, chiming in with a lot of the things that Pascal is saying. I, I think, you know, that there are a key number of areas that uh, we've identified issues with and, and the supply chain is is one of the key ones from two um, perspectives, uh, human resource, human capital, and then also parts and pieces uh, that make the uh, system run smoothly. When you're looking at competent people coming out of COVID, there's a huge demand um, for getting the right people into your organization. And that means everybody is competing for those people who sort of are, are top, of, top of the pops, if I can say, which means that um, we're not all going to get those people that we wanted within um, our aspirations. So how do we ensure that the whole aviation ecosystem um, can recruit and, and ensure that uh, safety isn't compromised in the process? So can you can you lower entry requirements? Um, and if so, what does this look like? And if this is something that you're having to do as a strategy, and we see this a lot in the US, for example, with the feeder airlines, with the restrictions on um, the number of people who come into the flight deck from the 1500 hour and the hard cap of um, 65 is, is, you know, how, how do you sort of bring these people in and how do you ensure that they meet your requirements without uh, that risk? Um, and, and if so, if you have identified a greater safety risk, how are you gonna manage that? I think one of the things we're also considering within IATA across the whole uh, world is that when, when we're looking at human capital, it, it feeds into all parts of our system. As, uh, as Pascal indicated, you know, whether it's flight crew, whether it's cabin crew, whether it's maintenance, whether it's ground, whether it's air traffic control, everybody is feeling the bite at the moment. And there doesn't seem to be that natural through flow of where people are going to be coming from um, for, for supporting the aviation industry, not just now as we come out of COVID, but we're now seeing the OEMs projecting that um, we're going to have uh, sort of 35 million aircraft around by, by the time we get into about 2033, 2034. So where is that resource coming from? Where is that preparation now, not just for the summer season, but ensure that we become more resilient in the future. 
I think when we're looking at the supply chain, um, you know, we've got a lot of issues in the supply chain at the moment, whether that's because of uh, global political situations. Um, for example, there are parts of the world now which uh, have sanctions on them where where we can't um, sort of access parts where perhaps production lines were, were previously sort of a single point of failure. How are we going to ensure that um, the supply chain is able to support us, not just this summer, but moving forwards? And I'm looking at the practical implications of that. For example, are we going to see more aircraft carrying um, uh, MEL entries within the tech log? And if so, what does that mean to the crew? Other crew who are perhaps, um, and, and I was lucky when I was flying, to be working with airlines who, you know, had rectification intervals way within what the MEL was saying. How do we ensure that we're preparing crew to walk into the flight deck and look at the tech log and saying, OK, um, I have this piece of equipment, this piece of equipment not working at the moment. How am I going to change my operation? And I think, John, this comes down to something that um, I'm, I'm really keen on is making sure that whether you're sitting on the flight deck, whether you're in, you know, cabin crew, air traffic control, that you understand at the start of a day, what are those things that are, are perhaps going to make you less resilient? So thorough briefings at the beginning of a day, not just for yourself, but for your team is really, really critical. And, uh, you know, from a flight deck perspective, that threat and error management, what are the issues on the day that you have to deal with and how are you going to manage those from any other day to make sure that actually you do keep that show on the road and you do keep the operation safe? Yeah, thanks for that, Mark. I think it's great to see all the different topics you touched on. I was particularly interested in what you were saying there, the last part particularly about you know, the knock on effect of supply chain issues and what that means in terms of for people on the flight deck and, and you know, in terms of managing risks, perhaps that they might not, but, you know, perhaps new things and new challenges. And you know, it'll be interesting to come back and explore some of those a little bit more in a few minutes. Um, Osman, sorry, I went in the wrong order there. So um, if I can hand over to you and uh, uh, you need to unmute yourself first because I muted you there for a minute. Just there was a bit of background noise coming from you, but if you, maybe you can tell us from from an APM perspective, what are the challenges you see, and how does that fit together in all the different parts of the system? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, Jonathan. Yeah, we can hear you fine now. Okay, cool. Because I was looking for for unmuting. Um, so first, of all, I do have worries about the, uh, the the order of sequence. <laughs> Uh, that's that's not an issue. I was super impressed by first uh, Jasper's uh, introduction and then what Pascal and Mark uh, said. Uh, this again shows us that uh, it's, it's one sector. The aviation is one big family, and uh, we do share the same, well, it's the same challenges. But uh, now that we have listened to, to many many details, let me take a more general perspective first, John. Um, uh, what I would like to stress first is that I believe. And representing Council, the civil organization for uh, civil air navigation services organization, and, and, and globally, um, we have understood that the sector cannot just keep doing what we've been doing for, for the last decades and, and before the pandemic. So, as Council, we feel that aviation is as a turning point that might appear as a buzzword, but it's so true, right? We, um, we faced um, a number of crises in the last two years. And it's not only about COVID, the war between Russia and, and the Ukraine, but in addition, it's also about the increasing pressure to reduce aviation's climate impact, which is quite certainly not a, not a crisis, but a huge challenge for all of us, and to further reduce costs. So this, everything at the same time. So we're not talking about what happened in summer 2023 in terms of traffic is re rebounding and, and, and things like that. We have to do everything at the same time. So aviation is facing one of its biggest challenges, and how can we achieve fully scalable, safe, sustainable, resilient, and and uh, a cost-efficient airspace system? At the same time, integrating ever growing varieties of new airspace users, and we have to do this all at the same time because we're talking about small businesses. There are business uh, models behind, and and if we don't live up in time, they uh, they go bankrupt, right? So this this is we have to do everything at the same time and keep everything super safe. We we'll talk about human capital. This is uh, uh, a great issue for for industries globally as well. Uh, I took some notes from Jasper and from Mike and from Pascal. We were talking about human capital. That's very much true. So we lack of stuff. 
we're not talking only about air traffic control officers. We also talk about ATSEP, so air traffic service electronic personnel. We talk about IT specialists. And this is another challenge. Um, it's not only traffic regarding, it's also some security. Um, we are, the aviation sector is attacked more and more and more directly. And ANSP are facing attacks that were never used before. Your control was just attacked successfully a couple of weeks ago uh, and, and others as well. So we have to invest here. We have to have the right people. We have to take money and invest money. Um, so uh, lots, lots of lots of challenges here. Um, perhaps I should stop here because we have a couple of time, but just to add some some more aspects for, for two or three minutes. Thank you, John. Fantastic. Thanks, Osman, for that one. And Libor, maybe I can come to you from a, from an airport perspective. What are your thoughts on the kind of challenges that you're dealing with, and you know the interfaces in between all the different parts of of the system? Yes, thank you, John, and I will try to look at it a little positive because my key takeaway from the uh, pandemic period is that uh, the aviation safety is generally very safe, uh, safe in its uh, foundation. And uh, despite all the challenges and uncertainties of, uh, of the time, the aviation operated safely and we recorded uh, just uh, let's say minor incidents uh, which was uh, which was really great and uh, we can really build on these foundations uh, both during the pandemic and also in the period immediately after when the traffic was uh, increasing uh, rapidly uh, the aviation proven uh, to uh, to be safe and uh, uh, this this is maybe uh, the point uh, that uh, that we can use also uh, for the uh, for the future. This is uh, why I sometimes uh, think that uh, we should uh, maybe just uh, continue doing uh, what we already do, and uh, there is no need for major changes uh, in the regulation for aviation safety. Uh, because the stability is the basis for safety and not a frequent change. And also the members of the ACI Technical Operation Safety Committee uh, sometimes point out uh, the increasing uh, compliance burden and they feel to be focusing more and more on compliance uh, instead of safety. Uh, because the lack of resources is not uh, just the case uh, of the security screeners uh, or handling drivers and also uh, people in the offices uh, taking care about safety and compliance. So finding the right balance between the amount of regulation, the details of the rules and uh, resulting workflow for airport operators is essential. And here I want to thank uh, all of you in EASA, you, John, Jesper, and uh, also Julia Agerer uh, for your openness, uh, because uh, you are always here and ready to discuss uh, with us ACI and uh, finding the right balance uh, between the regulation and the, and the work, workload. Well, uh, this was uh, the pandemic and uh, immediately after pandemic, uh, but what we feel uh, today is a uh, is little different because uh, let's have a look uh, uh, to, the, to the US uh, first three months uh, of the 2023 uh, bring uh, five uh, category A runway incursions uh, in US uh, that are investigated by the NTSB, which is really unusual. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, has not happened uh, over many, many years. And uh, this is what we should uh, focus on as well. And uh, we also see here in Prague that uh, something uh, is maybe changing uh, because uh, surprisingly we have recorded uh, several crossings of a lit stop bar, uh, red lights, uh, which is uh, which is the golden rule, uh, never cross the red bar. And in the past, we could rely on our stop bars as the main barrier preventing runway incursions. And now the same airport, the same stop bars, the same traffic, and uh, also the same procedures like before the pandemic. But the safety performance has changed anyway. 
So at least on our local level, uh, this is the safety challenge number one and the field where we must uh, work together uh, with all stakeholders involved in local runway safety team and find the causes uh, and the solutions. We have to uh, go to, to very basics uh, because uh, it is, uh, it is uh, really, let's say, uh, the rule number one, do not uh, cross the red bar. And, and my last point, uh, it is uh, again, as uh, Pascal, uh, Mark and also Osman pointed out that uh, finding and retaining the right people, uh, it gets better definitely because uh, the 2022 uh, was even worse. And uh, this year, thanks to the excellent job uh, of the HR department, uh, uh, we have people, we have many new colleagues, so the challenge is uh, to, to onboard them for the safety management system, educate them in safety culture and uh, in safety reporting. So if in case of interest, I can show you later what we do, how we work uh, with the new people at the airport because uh, the summer season is already there and uh, we have to be uh, very quick. So we have some people, it is not that bad, uh, but uh, we know that uh, we will make the season only thanks to massive overtimes and uh, the willingness of people to take extra shifts during the summer. So we will face the fatigue and uh, this is uh, what we will focus on during the entire summer in our safety management system. That's from my side. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Liboy. There were some great topics there, and I know we'll come back to, to a lot of them over the course of the discussion. Osman, I saw you, you raised your hand there. You had something to follow up on that with. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, John, and, and, and thank you, Luba. We've had a good conversation uh, amongst fellow colleagues, which, which is a good thing. And I just want to 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 uh, to react and and to to put emphasis on what Liber and, and my colleagues uh, have, have said. When we talk resilience, uh, uh, resilience has very much to do with people, right? And uh, we do not only refer to our own experiences, but uh, if you look at studies conducted by Deloitte or McKinsey or the big uh, consultancy organizations, they try to figure out what was the, the main cause or contributing factors for many of or some organizations being more successful during crisis or the pandemic than others. And it was also always about being adaptive, adaptive, being creative, being responsive, being fast, uh, being capable of improvising. And that's all about people, right? And, and, and this is what I would like to, 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 uh, to just echo, that it's, it's not only about, uh, about the lacking of people, it's really about uh, treating your people well. So uh, we will come to some only with additional shifts as well. And just to put it so nicely, saying don't push the ball, don't push too much, uh, don't stretch your people. I think this was uh, what he said. Don't stretch your people over months and months until October. He will definitely end up in a fatigue issue and, and other problems. So th this is really one of the challenges we all share, I believe. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Osman. And, and maybe Pascal, if I come to you from a, a, an operational perspective, particularly, let's, let's if we start talking about the people element and some of the challenges we face. Yeah, you know, what kind of practical challenges are you, are you facing? You know, and you see for airlines, particularly over the summer ahead. Well, I, I think for airline, it's it's the same as uh, in the in the whole industry. Um, uh, we are growing. Uh, we are restarting operations at a very fast pace. And um, sometimes if you have a couple of people who report sick at the same time, you have a, a huge strain on the system. Uh, being able to fulfill all the duties, all the flights that you have planned. Um, add to this the supply chain issues that we have mentioned. Uh, and you have some technical failures, some uh, spare aircraft are well, a rare uh, item at this time. So all of this is, of course, putting a lot of strain on the system and asks uh, from the staff, from the pilots, cabin attendants to go the extra mile over and over again is putting uh, a lot of stress on them. 
Um, they see it as pressures or they might see it as pressures, although it's not meant as pressures, it's meant to keep the business running. Uh, but all of this uh, might lead to um, errors and uh, mistakes being made. It might lead to staff demotivation and so on. So, and then ultimately, uh, if staff don't feel well anymore, uh, they will seek for other opportunities and they will leave the company. And that's one of the big points that I think we didn't mention. We're all talking about um, hiring new people and finding the right stuff and whatever. What about a strong staff retention policy? Why are we letting our good stuff leave the company? I think that's something we need to think about. How can we make sure that these people stay with us and are loyal to the company? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting, uh, yeah, it's such a key thing. And we, you know, Pascal, you know, we've worked quite a lot on the well-being work over the last two, three years. And, you know, all the things that surround that in managing psychosocial risks and, you know, helping provide, you know, safe organisations that people want to work in. And maybe, Mark, if I come to you now for, you know, your thoughts particularly on that, and maybe you know, I know particularly at IATA you've got uh, a lot of work on safety leadership particularly, um, and, you know, the role of leadership in establishing the right culture that supports our people. How, how What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, God, there's a lot to unpack here, isn't there? Yeah. Um, uh, when, when I when I look at sort of um, I, I guess that mindset when when you're talking about safety leadership, um, what it, what it means to me, and what we're trying to get across with the safety leadership principles and charter that uh, we've re recently launched is how does everybody have the same frame of reference? So in other words, how do those people sort of sitting on the board of an organization and those frontline workers ensure that they're aligned? Uh, and when sort of somebody on the front line is seeing something that is uh, considered an unsafe practice and they report it as such that um, there is a there is a consistent understanding of that problem from top to bottom and bottom to top. So, so for me, it's um, when we talk about an open safety culture, it's meaning that everybody understands what we mean by that. And sometimes, and I've been privileged enough to be involved in a few conversations where a CEO has expressed a frustration that actually um, their their commitment and their drive for a an open safety culture doesn't seem to be understand understood collectively uh, by all those frontline workers, and that's because. Um, as as everybody hears what is being uh, espoused by the board to maybe a middle line of ma management and then to the frontline workers, is everybody translates it a little bit differently. So actually you could get maybe three or four groups of frontline workers who are absolutely critical to the safety of the organization, having a little bit of a different understanding about what safety culture means for them. And what we have to be really clear about is that safety culture and, and safety leadership not only ensures that the uh, organization is safer, uh, but is also more resilient to a lot of the problems that we're, we're talking about in, in this particular space. I mean, uh, if, if I'm sort of fit just briefly into that, um, you know, that human performance piece, which is always sort of one of those factors we look at when um, we have uh, an, an incident and it needs to be investigated. And we talk a lot about fatigue and stress is um, is trying to break that down into the various parts. What, what does it actually mean uh, for an individual? And again, if I sort of touch on this frame of reference, how the frame of reference from the ops team um, can be very, very different from the, the flight crew and can be very different from the maintenance. And, and how do we get everybody thinking in that same space is, is really, really critical. And the really, really, really big reason for why it's critical is every single person within the safety system in the aviation system is looking to keep the show on the road. Nobody wants to go um, and, and run out of hours down route. Nobody wants to sort of uh, find that their aircraft is AOG and they can't get a part to um, the aircraft for another few days. Nobody wants to find that um, 
uh, there, there are issues with ground services, which means that um, unless you depart on a certain time, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it's so complex. It's so complex. And I, I think, you know, it's really difficult um, when anybody is sort of in a, in, a, in a stressful situation and stress can be positive as well as negative. I mean, you know, I used to get a buzz, uh, quite honestly, a positive buzz from, you know, getting to the end of a day and knowing that I I had managed to depart on schedule. I'd managed to get everything working in, in the right clockwork fashion to make sure that actually at the end of the day, everything was delivered. And I think, you know, it's a big challenge between that professionalism of individuals and the pressure that is put on the, 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 uh, the system on a day to make sure that everything sort of meshes together perfectly, rather than you start of seeing chinks in, 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 um, in various parts of the operation, which means that things are, are out of sync, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I think it's really interesting you explore some of the you know, how how this is all connected, particularly when you start talking about the leadership side into people and you know all of these kinds of things. I'm just going to quickly share, uh, and it's particularly nice that both people on the polls when we asked people, you know, what were the top challenges, they match very much with the picture we had, which makes us particularly feel good in terms of our SRIB that's coming out because it means we haven't necessarily missed anything. Um, also, in terms of you know, the discussions that we've, that the, the different topics that the different panelists uh, have come up with here uh, are all kind of linked. And, and I try and summarize much, much of that in, in one slide so that as we kind of carry on the discussion now and look at some of the solutions that we've got, uh, you know, we've, we're starting from the same kind of place. So as, as Mark talked about there, and then it came out from some of the other panelists, you know, when it comes to my, uh, the mindset and the culture, you know, having an open culture and, and actually being clear what that means for people at different levels, um, and particularly how can we focus on reporting, and particularly this concept of when we talk in, the, in terms of our campaign about no compromise on safety, is it, you know, we've got the baseline of the rules and doing the right things, you know, continually following what we need to, but, you know, evolving, you know, particularly in terms of local procedures is, you know, questioning if we need to, how things are working and responding as an organization, rather than particular, as I've seen many, you know, a number of occasions where, individuals at the operational level are kind of forced to make operational workarounds uh, that aren't necessarily the way the system was designed, the procedure, the process, whatever, you know, and it's, it's when that responsibility re ends up being rested with the individual. And I think particularly for our audience is if there's one thing that particularly I know you could focus on is it's, you know, do you understand where your staff are being put in those positions. And I think that's a real challenge. And then particularly in terms of engagement, collaboration, um, and particularly then how we support our people, both in terms of finding and retaining them, and then managing fatigue and stress and, and all of those kinds of things. And maybe uh, as a, a kind of next follow on uh, point, perhaps Libor, you know, we start talking about now some of the solutions Libor, if I maybe come to you first and, and maybe you could share some thoughts on you know, how you've been preparing your workforce for the summer. I know it's particularly been a, a really big activity for you at Prague, like probably the others, and you know, we'll come and, and you know, see how that experience fits with others. Thank you, John. And I can show all of you uh, maybe three pictures uh, what we do in Prague because uh, we organized the safety week uh, already a couple of weeks ago. And this was intentional because uh, the summer is coming, as I said, and uh, the many new workers uh, are at the airport already. And uh, it was time in uh, you know, let's say beginning of May uh, to get in touch with them and uh, try to onboard them for the safety management. And uh, what we do is that uh, we take uh, this one uh, Cobus uh, 3000 uh, from our airport operations department. Many thanks for that. Uh, 
we put uh, some safety promotion inside the bus and we have a coffee machine and we have uh, snacks already and uh, some quizzes uh, for small gifts and uh, we go uh, around the apron from a place to place so we stop uh, at the place for about an hour uh, open the doors and uh, we invite uh, the people especially from the ramp to come into the bus and uh, discuss with us uh, about uh, about the safety so for us uh, it is a chance to to uh, promote the safety uh, give them some some key messages uh, about the major operation risks and so on and in the same time we are ready to receive the feedback from them uh, about uh, what goes well on the apron, uh, what is not that good, uh, where uh, we could improve the safety, what the aircraft stands are problematic or uh, particular aircraft types uh, and their handling and so on and so on. So this is uh, for me a modern way how to, uh, how to uh, address the safety reporting because uh, we know that uh, people are uh, sometimes uh, too lazy to report anything, but, but it seems uh, that uh, if we uh, go towards them, uh, uh, be in the, in contact with them, they are more open to discuss. Uh, I can just point out that uh, this is uh, the third year uh, we organize the safety bus and uh, in the year number one especially and also in the second year uh, it was a uh, little difficult because uh, the people were afraid to come into the bus uh, they were afraid of uh, being tested for, from the rules or, or maybe uh, for the consumption of alcohol i don't know uh, but now uh, they are okay uh, with with the event uh, they are not scared and uh, they come in and uh, after three or four coffees they they are <laughs> open to talk about anything so we get really an excellent uh, safety reporting and we are also sometimes invited to to go with them to, to a tow tractor uh, or to the fuel truck to uh, to get a test ride with them and uh, feel the real situations uh, in specific places. So this is uh, what has paid off uh, to us, and this is what we uh, what we will definitely do also in the future. And uh, the timing is uh, in April and beginning of May because, as I said, uh, the preparation for summer season and uh, contacting the new personnel and uh, we also do the event uh, in the fall and this is uh, this is in this case to to prepare the airport for, for the winter season so this is an example from Prague what we do uh, for both existing and the new employees on the ramp and, and perhaps Osman if I could come to you because that's an example of you know in one place one environment but I know a lot of your work is is collaborating you know, proper you know not proper cross main, but yeah, with all sorts of different stakeholders, and and particularly you know, whether it's with Canto or, or with DFS, yeah, you know, what kind of things are you doing then in terms of wider collaboration? Mm. Um, okay, you will stop sharing this wonderful uh, picture, great initiative. Um, maybe uh, st starting from uh, from an ANSP as DFS, uh, we do prepare every coming summer. Um, by having so-called safety and security weeks where we um, um, stress um, specific um, areas. So this time it was leadership, it was uh, teamwork and communication, super important um, uh, when, uh, when it, uh, it's about achieving something together. And um, it's really about, I just, I, I would love to, to, uh, to hook on what has been said before by my colleagues. Um, but when we drive a culture, call it safety culture, corporate culture, whatever it is, right? We call it safety culture. It's all about what we want to achieve together. And for an ANSP or an aviation safety, I think it's the top, um, uh, uh, the top goal we want to achieve, uh, of, of course. Um, it's all about contributing to an environment where psychological safety prevails, right? Where people uh, can speak up, talk openly, 
uh, where we do not know uh, the, the information where we do not go like anything, whatever it is against safety, right? So to encourage people to report, we uh, we do, and this is not only DFS, and this is globally, this is very much cancer driven as well. We do support. You know, provide um, things like that where we say reporting is important. What happens with your report, right? So why is it important? What happens with your report? Where's the impact? Do we do, do, do something with it? Super, super important. I would like to uh, refer to to my talking about the frame of reference, right? For us, and now we're talking about many solutions, right? For us, this is super important because thousands of people coming to work every morning, they all want to do a good job, right? And sometimes we end up when we talk system thinking, a kind of local rationality. People want to do their very best um, in terms of customer orientation. They offer things uh, which which might be a good idea, right? But going back into the wider uh, scope, uh, we have to understand that everything we do locally has definitely not can have, but has an impact in the entire network, right? And therefore, and this may be already a solution for us. It's really important to remind the people: please stick to the procedures. And when we talk cross domain, this is actually what we do. We, we our unions, we talk with the safety community over there, with just the ethical community, with the technical experts, we talk to airlines, to airports, and we agree on things, right? Let's do it this way to best overcome this summer and all the challenges um, coming with this summer, right? So this, this is one thing. Uh, a better adherence to procedures, a better adherence to uh, phraseology. This could help a lot already. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Osman. And, and maybe Pascal, if I can, can come to you from your side. You know, obviously, as an airline, you have a, you know, a wide reaching network all across Europe and, and beyond. You know, how are you continually collaborating and working with all the different stakeholders you have in your network and you rely on in terms of supporting your, uh, your, your, your operation to keep moving? Well, I think uh, one one of the most important things has already been mentioned, uh, and, and I know Ayata and Mark are working quite a lot on that, is strong leadership. Um, uh, this is absolutely uh, one of the uh, most important points that you need to have. Um, and then the second one, I think Osman has mentioned it as well, uh, strict adherence to SMS processes. Uh, top down and bottom up is of utmost importance uh, in these days. Um, we need to make sure that things go wrong from time to time, and we need to make sure that if things go wrong, we analyze them correctly and we apply our just culture processes properly and setting the limits on what is tolerable and what is not must be very clear for all employees and all contracted activities as well. Um, and last but not least, I think commitment to safety at all levels of the company needs to be visible. We need to lead by example, and we need to be very responsive to even small safety problems at, at all levels of the company. I think that's one of the most important things uh, that we uh, that we are doing. Uh, the other thing, and, and, and again, I'm coming back to this over and over and over and over again. I think that we need to understand that our staff members are our most valuable asset. Uh, we need to take care of them, recognize them for their efforts, for job well done. How often do you do you recognize your people and acknowledge your people for a job well done? Uh, we need to help them and acknowledge them for the extra mile taken for the good of the company. Show them appreciation and do not take all this for granted uh, because it isn't. And if you think it's for granted, well, then you will wake up with some bad surprises someday uh, because absenteeism, lack of motivation and the following incidents and accidents that you will have due to this uh, is the consequence. And of course, as I mentioned before, loyalty to the company will disappear. So uh, these are the things that I think are very important. So communicate with your stuff, communicate, analyze incidents, make sure that uh, just culture processes are being applied and that you treat people the right way. Thanks for that, Pascal. I think uh, yeah, fantastically put. I couldn't, I couldn't have put that better myself. And I think yeah, as you start to, we start to unpick particularly the parts of different uh, ready resilient and responsive and it's you know good to see how all of this comes out particularly in terms of supporting our people and and helping them to be resilient and really understanding what that looks like and then particularly you're saying about on the responsive side is 
when they tell us things, do we change anything? Do we feed that back? And all of the things that then go into, you know, our staff. You know, how often has somebody raised? I used to, I used to like doing this. I used to do safety uh, presentations to, to people in organisations. And when you ask people how many, you know, how many people have submitted a safety report, and usually there's lots of hands. And then how many people got thanked for their safety report and got told what happened afterwards? And the number of hands that are that, that are still up are pretty small. And, and I think that's particularly one of the key things about it. Um, Mark, maybe if I can come to you on a kind of on the organisational kind of collaboration and, and cross domain kind of side at the, from the start first point. You know, how does that fit from your side? What, are, you know, what kind of solutions are you talking about to your members as kind of focusing where to where to focus their efforts? Thanks very much, John. Um, a couple of things I'd love to pick up on first. Um, I'm, 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 I think this compromise thing, no compromise in safety is an interesting piece uh, because quite honestly, if there's no compromise in safety, there wouldn't be any airplanes flying. So actually, you know, we, we, we do this, uh, you know, risk management through, you know, five T's would be my way is to treat, tolerate, terminate, transfer or exploit. And what we do to get people traveling from one place in the world to another is we exploit um, the opportunities that air travel does by managing our risks to ensure that they are always at a tolerable level. And I think that's really interesting um, that, that we have this sort of conversation where people understand that if we do have to compromise on safety, but we do so in a very measured and calculated way so that the risk is at a tolerable level. And why I say that is when we talk about reporting and actually reporting mechanisms, um, and, and going back to what I was saying area earlier about people having their own frame of reference, is people look at their ops manual, people look at um, you know the reporting format as required in Europe, and then determine themselves whether an incident is requiring to be reported or not. And um, and when they're going through this process, there are a number of factors, how their day's been, where they are in the day. Um, and, and one of the things that always sort of got to me, I guess, was, um, you know, what is the mechanism for reporting within your organisation? Is it a piece of paper like this that you need to fill out and then um, fax, if there are still faxes in, in Europe, um, to, to your safety manager at the end of the day? Is it a digital format? Is it a digital format that is at hand or do you have to go back after maybe a 12 hour flying day and then complete a form? So I think, you know, we need to understand how we can enhance reporting understanding that uh, it, with that privilege of responsibility is responsible for all safety practitioners to report. But and then as you've hit the nail on the head, John, people need that feedback. And that feedback needs to be positive, but also it does need to be quick. And I think as an organization, people have to understand in that busy summer schedule, what do we mean by quick feedback? If there's got to be some sort of investigation that takes place afterwards, it's not going to be overnight. So how do you keep people sort of uh, um, engaged through that process and known that um, you're not going to get an email saying we're very busy at the moment. We'll get back to you when we get to November. That's no good to anybody. So actually, you've got to measure people's. You've got to measure people's expectations. And I think the most important thing for me is how is this shared? Okay, I've been very lucky to sort of see in some organisations where this is shared brilliantly. It is genuine. It is impactful and it allows a two way conversation to be uh, progressed after that. So you're bringing people in, maybe who weren't involved in an event, to be part of the conversation to make things better. When we look at people, I think, um, you know, that retention piece that Pascal uh, mentioned is, is hugely critical. We can't afford to have that outflow of people like we did in COVID. OK, so how do we ensure that those people have that personal, you know, buy in and, and desire to be part of their organisation? And, and I think, you know, acknowledging our people is really, really important. And some organisations do this brilliantly. You know, a simple thank you, believe it or not, goes a long, long way. 
and uh, making sure that people understand what that means and people feel that actually they're contributing to a safe, well-oiled machine throughout that really busy summer season is, is really, really um, critical. And I think just looking at that future-proof piece, not just for this summer, but moving forward, is how do we expand that pool of competent people that we desperately need within aviation? So, you know, we, we are very, very clear that we need to find these people, but are we looking at diversity as we should? Are we including everybody within the conversations? I mean, I don't know what it's like to sort of become an airline pilot now, but when I was looking, trying to find the information on this was only sort of uh, appearing for a privileged few. So I'd like to sort of make sure that everybody understands how rewarding aviation is as a career and know where that conduit is to to actually get into aviation in whatever speciality they feel um, really, really uh, focused on. Getting back to your conversation question, John, around um, you know how do we how do we keep that ecosystem safe? I think you know it's I think it was your fourth point on on your slide around rules and procedures, um, and, and and you know for me the big thing is whatever part of a system you're in standard operating procedures are there for a reason they're there for a reason to ensure that actually whether you're sitting somebody sitting next to somebody or in a conversation with somebody who is as old as you are in the industry or brand new you actually understanding and appreciating the key points in that uh, conversation that you're having it's really important that you avoid complacency. When I was flying, I, I, I don't know why it was, but it seemed quite cool by a number of people sitting in the right-hand seat to sort of prove that they didn't need to pull out the checklist and read the three lines for the before landing checks. They could do it all by memory. The checklist is there for a reason. OK, and you won't need it on that low pressure daily routine, but you will need it when something has happened that has made you forget something that you would uh, absolutely need in ensuring that that operation remains safe. And the note I, I sort of saw as the rules and procedures is updating processes and procedures. Yeah, absolutely. We need to be agile and we need to be able to sort of see where an event has taken place and we need to sort of make an immediate change. But when we're in that busy summer schedule, can I please sort of say, let's not make change for change sake. And let's also understand that actually if we do need to make um, changes, understand what the impact is, not just in your ecosystem, but the whole aviation system and any unintended consequences. So there's a few food for thought that I think uh, I thought I'd, uh, I'd like to bring to the party now. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Mark. And it's interesting what you were saying about checklists there is uh, having forgotten, done things like forgotten to press record and other things when we've done these webinars. I have my checklist on a huge whiteboard on the wall just because I know the pressure of starting these sessions is going to be chaos. So even at a practical basic level, we're still using that here. It's interesting what you said, particularly there about the term compromise. And you know, we do, we debated that quite a bit in the building, some of us, is for exactly what the reason you said is that you know if we if we genuinely meant no compromise whatsoever on safety, nothing would happen and nothing would get off the ground. And it's you know, it's it starts the conversation about how you know, where do you need to compromise? How do you do that effectively? And, and I think you articulated that so well, is it you know, there will be tough decisions to be made throughout the summer by all sorts of people. It's you know, whether you just let your staff to hope for the best or whether you have that clearly set as a decision making approach within your organization by the right people who can take the right responsibility. I think you, know, you, you said that really well. So maybe Libor, I'll come to you first uh, for a follow up on that one and then Osman uh, to you next. Libor. Thank you, John, and especially thank you, Mark, for an excellent point raised, uh, because uh, I think that every safety report that we receive uh, through our reporting channel uh, puts our SMS uh, into the reputation risks, because the reporters uh, obviously expect from us, uh, the safety office, that we solve their problem and uh, we solve it quickly. And this is not always possible. So for me, uh, 
this is not much uh, about uh, not compromising safety, but uh, I feel that my work is uh, the the never ending uh, finding uh, of the right balance between the safety capacity and sometimes the environmental impact. So uh, especially if we get a report about, uh, I don't know, the lack of space uh, on a specific aircraft sense, uh, this is uh, definitely about the infrastructural change. And here we need uh, a lot of cooperation uh, with the planning department or operations department uh, because uh, we have to again balance the safety with capacity and sometimes uh, we need the full support of the operation operations to uh, sometimes reduce the capacity in order to to be able to to solve uh, the space issue and uh, <clears throat> find a good solution uh, for the safety report because if we fail uh, with uh, one report, uh, this is uh, still OK, but uh, in case we are unable to solve uh, two or three reports in the row, uh, then the entire SMS reporting uh, will be uh, put, uh, uh, put in the risk and uh, it will then not be used by the employees. That was my point. Fantastic. Thanks for that great summary. And maybe Osman, I come to you next to follow up on that one. Yes, yes. I, I would like to uh, um, to reflect on the other point and then uh, pick up the, the question you said, what do you do globally um, uh, as uh, uh, a council, for example, or, or council members? Um, you already touched on it. Uh, talk about not compromising safety. It's super important uh, to, to figure out, do we speak the same language? Do we have a common understanding when we use whatever kind of term? So uh, start at, at your department, at your directorate, and then go. <laughs> uh, but this is the first thing. So therefore, we put a lot of emphasis on communication and to understand each other better, right? Um, and this requires contact. So this was, uh, and I have, to, I have to talk around it because I see some feedback that my, my audio is poor. So, with the classroom, I have met a number of, of heads of operation who do not visit the classroom on a regular basis. I would always su suggest, in particular in summer, do it at least once a day, if not twice a day, right? Be it a tower or an emblem center or, or whatever. So stay in contact. Talk to a people and talking means listening. Yeah. Communication is all about listening. So this is the first thing. Um, then change for the sake of change. That's true. But we are under tremendous pressure and some of our systems are reaching the end of life cycle. So as you perfectly have seen in Europe, uh, our French colleagues have put successfully into operation a new system. At DFS, we did that. You can go global in Bahrain, they just did that. And it's necessary because we are dealing with lots and lots of legacy systems. So, and these, these are the challenges. But again, when talking about resilience uh, and, 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 and the question, do we talk the same language? Do we have a common understanding? We can say, what is resilience? But how do we build resilience? And I like to refer to a like, Three like a chair, you know, this the three like a chair. So one is technology, the other one's organization, and the other one is, is the people. And, and we already talked about that. How can we achieve uh utmost degree of collective, let's call it mindfulness, right? So what's going on in my system? Where do I have to put my, my attention, my money? Where do I have to react? And this is again talking to people and, and feeding back. I didn't plan for that, but I would love to share just, just shortly something I have released, um, which is our uh, safety letter. Um, and this is a safety letter special, perhaps you can see that. It was just released in, in May 2023. And uh, it's about um, uh, many, many things, but also about the feedback. Let me jump to this thing. Uh, lots of interesting articles, but. Uh, this was about nonviolent uh, communication. You have seen the giraffe, maybe. Nonviolent <laughs> communication. It's about a feedback on what the results from the last safety and security culture survey. 
and, and this is based, it's digital and, and whatever. And here we go detail to every feedback. So this was the area of uh, the meaning of safety, compliance, it was about uh, the procedures, uh, management, leadership, things like that, right? Um, and uh, staff situation, uh, training, and we got feedback, we gave feedback to everyone. This is super, super in general, so therefore I stop sharing it. But I just want to to uh, to echo that it's super important to, to stay in contact, to talk to the people, and respond to that feedback, and do something with the feedback. So divide the appropriate measures and, and put them in, in, into place. What I would like to share globally is that it's all about engagement and collaboration with stakeholders, in general, but in particular for for the season. It's about training skills, staff competence. It's about uh, updating environmental procedures for severe weather situations uh, uh, when we talk with the airlines. It's about training management and, and, and the tools and methods. Uh, we already talked about the adherence to procedures. We put that together. It's the equipment readiness and so on and so forth. There are many, many things. We're talking about ADCOs. Here in the crowd, you see already a tremendous demand of, of traffic. So we do have. Uh, high traffic loads, but globally, um, many, many echoes uh, still suffer from, from uh, the routine and really strongly um, uh, recommend to invest time and, of course, money because they are expensive. So, to invest time and money to conduct high traffic load simulations um, for echoes to replicate saturated sectors. So, uh, again, for the core of Europe, uh, we have our light traffic globally. Situation uh, in, in some in some areas, and another thing which has been stressed, uh, and we really go about that is human performance management. So when we strongly advise everyone to revisit, uh, for example, at air traffic control officer rostering to balance workload and, and rest, especially in sectors near maximum capacity. So this is this is something we do recommend uh, amongst other things globally. Back to you, John. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks for that insight, uh, Osman. It's really great to kind of understand the practical things there. And, you know, it's great to see example of your newsletter, particularly and, you know, from our side. We, we've been doing this conversation, Aviation Magazine, and the next version of that will come out at the end of June. But it, it's, you know, it, it's fine. For, it's just showing all the different examples of practical communication and that kind of thing. Um, Pascal, I'll come back to you next, maybe with some thoughts on some of the practical things that you're doing in your organization yeah i would i would just i don't don't want to use up all the rest of the time but uh um okay. for, the, for the operational aspects i think i have one very important message uh now that we have some idea what the challenges might be for the coming summer season or for the ongoing summer season i think there's ample time to analyze your system identify safety issues and do or review some associated risk assessments and then you can prioritize the allocation of your safety resources according risk levels uh, and i think that's something a very practical advice uh, because very often we are putting resources into places where you actually don't need them immediately there are other parts of the system that are more at risk and i think that is something that is often not done so it's at its time not the right moment to waste time or resource for unimportant things that you can do later uh, i think it's important that you analyze your system know where your risks are and then base the allocation of resource based on these risks or risk levels that you have determined and why not set some short-term safety performance indicators and targets for the summer season which you really monitor on the short term not on the long term as the other targets that you might have and uh, additionally add some alert levels to identify potential things that uh, move into the wrong direction so in basically it means use your sms to your full to its full potential that's i think one of the most important things that I want to want to tell the people as short term solutions to the challenges we have identified. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Pascal. And, and maybe so we have a, a, a first question from uh, Ansgar from ACI is and maybe I start with you, Pascal, as you were just talking there is you talk about things in your organization, but Ansgar asks what views on how to share safety reporting and information across organizations? Is that something you do particularly where you have I know contracted services or with particular airports. Oh. How do you do that kind of thing in in Luxair? 
Well, um, I must say internally and externally, we do a monthly um, update on the reporting that we have. So uh, we share that with all employees um, because uh, as uh, uh, as we have seen already now from Osman and so on, um, feedback is very important to make sure that people do not report uh, into the dark, uh, but they know something is happening to their reports. Um, if you don't do that, uh, it's it's not uh, it's not going to happen. So that's that's quite important. Now you can also share your reports uh, with a special. Um, entities like IATA is having the uh, GADM, for example. Uh, you can have special contracts with your contractors uh, in which you send them their safety, your safety communications like safety digest and so on. We do that on a monthly basis. We have three different uh, communication styles. We have a safety digest just giving statistics on FDM and reporting. Uh, we have a direct feedback for all the reporters and we have a monthly summary of all reportings that is going out under various different forms to national authorities uh, and to our contractors and internal staff, of course. Yeah, it's good to hear. Maybe Libor, if I ask you the same question, you obviously have reporting within the airport itself, but how do you share that perhaps with operators or, or other people around the airport? How do you do that? Yeah, we run both the local runway safety team and the apron safety team on a monthly basis. Uh, so we are in frequent contact uh, with uh, with our partners at the airport. Uh, we also have a team's channels uh, established uh, with them, so so we can chat anytime, uh, discuss or or send I don't know the safety promotion to them. So so this is this is happening for, for a long time and uh, we just uh, continue what uh, we have already been doing. And I guess Mark from an IATA side, it's something you do a lot. You know, I know you've got lots of channels for your members and, and you know, the uh, different forums and things like that. Um, yeah, thanks, John. Um, as Pascal mentioned, I mean, our global aviation data base is, is really, really quite um, important. And uh, we have we have our flight data exchange, uh, which is more about sort of the the automatic data download from aircraft. And then we have our instant data exchange, which is really important for not just understanding what ha has happened, but looking for trends and issues of things that um, are, are happening and sort of seeing if, if there's any sort of uh, divergence from a norm that we need to understand in a bit more detail. I think also to um, add to that, we have our global safety risk management framework, which is available on IATA.org. And that's going to be renamed um, because it's a bit of a, a tongue twister uh, to a safety issue hub. Now, we don't own the risks, but actually uh, our members are very happy to share the risks um, that they're exposed to. And, and so this is sort of like becoming a conduit of best practice, I guess, not in just capturing the risks that um, are being shared, but understanding through um, what airlines are doing within um, their own safety risk uh, analysis and, and management process is to to address them uh, and, and where we're really sort of taking this is that um, this is collecting where I guess systemic risks are most prevalent at some some point in time and this is feeding now into our new risk-based IOSA which is our transition from the old compliance-based um, IOSA where we used to just go in and uh, check every airline for the 962 ISARPs that are there to actually understanding where those focal areas are where risks perhaps are more prevalent um, within within an organization or across a system and coming out of those audits with safety insights, understanding where people are managing risks that maybe we didn't understand, maybe where there are challenges that uh, we weren't aware of, and feeding them back into the safety issue hub so that everybody collectively can understand um, what are those issues being addressed around the world um, and, and where best practice may lie. So we're joining all of this together to make sure that we're really clear about not just collecting this stuff, but sharing and allowing others through a 
a, a um, continuous feedback loop to provide where actually they are doing things a little bit differently and maybe that will support others who are probably a little bit less mature because I mean around the world we have some you know real leaders and, and trailblazers out there but we also have some people who are struggling to do the basics so we're, this is upskilling everybody. Yeah absolutely. Uh, yeah, and I think Osman, I know there's a lot of similar work that you do absolutely collaboratively with different organizations and within cancer itself. Maybe you can tell us a bit more about that from your side. Absolutely, absolutely with Mark. So uh, maybe compared to the IOSA approach uh, at Cancer Global, we do have our standards of excellence and safety management, which is continuously uh, uh, um, um, adopted and uh, amended and uh, this, this had a huge impact and this is exactly the situation you find more mature organizations and less mature organizations whatever maturity means in this in this concept but it helps right and uh, in addition to that uh, as we all focus on, on the importance of our people um, um, we do have uh, developed safety uh, standards of excellence and human performance management addressing all the issues which we're talking about health and well-being where we see fatigue and, and, and rostering and things like that so uh, do, we do the same um, with the, within the focus of human performance management we share data, we share occurrences at global level um, we, we do run a, um, a work group a number of work groups uh, within the safety community and the operations community within council or safety intelligence here for just one example uh, to provide one example where we really strongly work with partners outside of the ASP community to become much better in, in predictive analytics and understanding data uh, and and deriving the right measures to identify hotspots and uh, to to have things set before they occur so this this is something we do and sharing is uh the one, the one and, and all the orientation of, of cancer, for example, sharing and learning, yeah, so that everyone can can um, benefit from being a member and 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 and, uh, and, and grow, right? Super cool. Thank you. And, and I think that's one of the things, perhaps, to mention to everybody is you know, there were great examples there from all of our panelists. Whether it was you know, what Pascal was saying, and you know, Pascal, I know you do a lot of work with the European Regional Airlines Association, and particularly that association for for the regional community, you know, supporting members, and particularly the Ops and Safety Committee, uh, and all the work that you do collaborating there. You know, similarly, Mark, you were saying, you know, IATA and all the resources for your members. Similarly, I know ACI and and the work that that the team in Europe and at global level for ACI do providing. All sorts of material and similarly, you know, as Osman talked about there from a Cantho perspective, you know, all, all of those different organizations and there are many other collaboratively. I know, you know we do a lot of work also. I know Nikki from the, the European Transport Workers Federations uh, on the call. I saw a, a comment from you from Nikki earlier, you know, and there are lots of others, whether it's, uh, you know, covering uh, maintenance and continuing air, the airworthiness and all sorts of other domains. But there are collaborative organizations who do a lot of amazing work supporting the individual communities they serve and helping to connect each other. And, you know, the fact that we have you know, four big associations here talking and collaborating on this session is, is really, really great. Um, so it kind of highlights the resources. And then similarly from our side, actually just to mention also the kind of first part of the SIB that will come out will highlight from our collaborative work with our different stakeholders all of the different um, you know, safety issues and things that we've seen and that particularly many of those we've talked about today and really help you to kind of see if you're struggling to think what safety issues you might face you know, that provides at least a baseline to say well coll collaboratively with our stakeholders this is what we've identified ourselves um, there was a comment from uh, a question from Roberto who asked again is about reporting and, and you know, uh, is there a platform for raising reports and sharing information? I think you know, particularly that's where, you know, as, as we were talking about, the individual uh, associations particularly support their community, EASA as well. Um, and I put also a link in the answer to the aviationreporting.eu. Uh, website. So if any of you, it, it, that's more about when you have reports from your organization, you need to share with your national uh, European national authority in an EASA context is 
this European reporting portal, if you're not aware of it, is available there to at least help you share reports in if you have no other way of doing it. If you have a huge volume of reports, yeah, you know, I would suggest you perhaps talk to your national authority about a more automated process. But particularly if you know if you're a smaller organization reporting to your authority on a fairly infrequent basis, then I would suggest you do that. So we're coming towards the end of the session. I just want to, to, to kind of finish the session by coming round to each of their panelists and just to get kind of, you know, maybe 30 seconds or so of a, a key takeaway that you would have for our audience for the summer and, and looking ahead to the, to the next few months. So uh, if we come round, perhaps, uh, uh, Libor, I start with you from your perspective. What would be your kind of key takeaway for the summer? Nice, thank you. Uh, I believe in the maturity of the civil aviation safety in Europe, and I'm absolutely sure that uh, we will make the season the safe way. But we have to keep in mind that uh, we do this in a way which is not sustainable. And this is maybe my wake up call for the entire community uh, because too much overtime and extra shift uh, will again exhaust the first line employees. And we don't do it for the first time. Uh, it was already the case uh, in the summer 2022. Uh, we will do it again this year, and I'm not sure uh, if uh, it is uh, sustainable even for 2024. So we have to work together even more in attracting uh, new employees uh, for aviation work, especially with the, with the young people, young talents, and uh, secure the next generation of uh, aviation professionals. And uh, this is uh, what we should uh, focus on. Thank you. And thank you for organizing the evening. Thanks, Libor. And yeah, thanks for the input there. Mark, from your side, what would be your key takeaway? I think uh, a well-oiled machine has people as its most important asset. So value them, empower them, thank them, welcome feedback from all levels, listen and take it on board, evolve together with the whole environment, enhance safety, and then celebrate success. Fantastic, thanks. Great summary, Mark. And uh, Osman, if I come to you next. It, it's good that we are um, on the same side. Of the, so it's it, for me. It's about um, un understand and appreciate and value the role and importance of our people first, and everything else will come along. Um, then coordination is essential to address and manage all the challenges together and effectively. Coordination amongst ANSPs with all the entities we have and organizations we have named before together, of course, from the European perspective, with the Euro control, the network manager, airlines, airports. And as Nibo pointed out, cooperate and support the regulator at national and international level. We can only do it and be successful together. So coordination, trust, collaboration is key to success. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks for that, Osman. And Pascal, if I come to you last. Yeah, last but not least, and I think we're on the same page, everybody. Um, I, I will just say, take care of your stuff. Uh, live your SMS. Uh, let it be alive and use it to its full potential. Uh, prioritize your resource allocation. You have limited resources. Don't waste them. Um, let's work together to keep our safety and our, in uh, our industry safe. And last but not least, on the long term, let's make aviation sexy again and show people that it is absolutely worse as, uh, seeing aviation as a possible career path. I think that's the most important thing we need to do. Let's, let's, you know, public is always getting the bad news. Let's tell them the good news. Aviation is great. Thanks, for that, and that was a perfect setup because there were two key things I was wanting to finish on. One is, you know, we talked about lots of really interesting and, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, challenging topics there. And, you know, it, it sounds like there are lots of challenges, but as I know Libor said, and, and it came out in some of the other discussions, we've learned an awful lot from where we were last year. And I think we are in a much better place as an industry than we were this time last year. So, you know, we should be proud of all of the collaboration and all the fantastic things that have been done from you know i know organizations that had wash-ups and, and learning lessons learning sessions from last summer in september october all through the winter 
and then preparations have been going on pretty much ever since. So we should all be proud of what we've done to get to where we are for the start of this summer. And then the other one is kind of similar to what Pascal said there. When we had our SAY 360 conference last year, uh, somebody said, perhaps it's time for aviation to get its mojo back. Now, I googled what a mojo was, so there are going to be two challenges we're going to set for everybody throughout the summer is if you see aviation's mojo, share it. And what we really want to do is start building up yeah, this kind of feel good. Yeah, we all came into aviation because we love it and it's there's something really special about it. And the more we can you know, we can make that kind of a positive case for our industry hopefully it helps to encourage people to stay and more people to join in the future because they know it's a great place to work that, that where we all do amazing things so thank you very much huge thanks to our panelists for joining uh, and for giving us all their fantastic insights and thanks also to all of the participants and everybody that joined and, and all of the discussions we had so thanks very much have a great summer and we'll be back at 1400 this afternoon with our air op session so thanks very much everybody take care bye bye Well done, Gordon.